Shalom Havarim and hello friends. It's good to see you on this Sunday morning or whenever it is you are watching this. I don't know about you, but I am missing sports. During this time of COVID-19, pretty much all athletic activities have been shut down or postponed. We're not even sure at this point if we will have a baseball season in 2020. But I know that I and others are missing sports. I miss watching them. I miss uh, participating in sports. But with so many sporting events canceled or po postponed, a television station recently announced that they're going to start showing competitive origami. Now you understand what competitive origami is, right? Origami is the art of folding paper. You can make you know, the swan or other fancy items out of paper. I can't, maybe you can. So do you know which station is going to start airing competitive origami? It's going to be on pay-per-view. Pay-per-view. Now I know you're laughing out there. That one was good. I don't care who you are. That's funny stuff right there. <laughs> All right, well today we are going to continue to work through the lectionary. And our passage is going to be from the book of Romans. It was written by the Apostle Paul. And today I'm going to drop some churchy words on you, okay? Don't be scared. Um, churchy words, and yes, that is a theolo theological term, churchy words. Uh, these are words that you hear in the church and pretty much nowhere else. It doesn't mean that we don't talk about these things outside the church. I think we do talk about these things. We just don't use the churchy language. And I just haven't found a good word to replace these words. Um, so let's see what these words really mean today and try to better understand them. The words that I want to look at today are grace and sin. Now, I know that probably half of you shut your computers off right there when I said the word sin because nobody likes to talk about sin. I don't like to talk about it. And um, I almost shut my computer off and I'm the one recording this. Uh, but please, don't run away. I hope that we can redeem these words. And yes, that is also another churchy word, but we're saving redemption for another day. Okay, let's look at Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through the first part of verse 2. The Apostle Paul has just been talking about grace, and we're going to get into what that means. He's been talking about God's grace and how God will forgive you, and God's grace is enormous, it's huge, um, it, it's um, something we are, you know, glad it exists. <laughs> so, Paul goes on in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? He answers his own question. He says, By no means. Other translations say, Forbid it. There's even more intense translations as well. We'll stop with that. So Paul, talking about grace, telling people about the forgiveness that God offers, says, don't just try to sin so that grace can increase. No, forbid it. By no means. Now, every time I hear or read this passage, I'm reminded of my very first day in my very first class of college. I'm 18 years old, and I still remember it like it was yesterday. I'm sitting in class, and the professor is reading through the syllabus like professors do on the first day, and a young man, his name was Brad, it still is Brad, um, Brad raises his hand and he asks the question, what's the very minimum I need to do to get an A in this class? And I remember just sitting there, you, you don't look around, you, you don't make eye contact, you just think to yourself, did you really just ask that? <laughs> I also don't remember how the professor responded. I'm sure he um, was kind and, and thoughtful, but, but what do you do when somebody just confesses to you, like, I want to do the very minimum in this class and still get the maximum award for doing it? So hold that story in the back of your mind. We're going to circle back to it here shortly. Let's start with some definitions. And the first one is that word that nobody wants to hear, it's that word sin. And think about it, where else do you hear the word sin except in the church? Nobody talks about sin like that. But again, I think we do talk about sin. 
we just think of it differently. Usually when we talk about sins in the church or even outside of the church, we're talking about what somebody else does. And, and we, we're really good at pointing out other people's flaws, other people's mistakes, and talking about their sins. This person has a gambling issue. This person has a drinking issue. This person is not faithful to their spouse. We, traditionally as a church, do a great job. I use that as, uh, I'm being sarcastic, um, a great job of pointing out other people's sins. But when we think about it from a biblical perspective, sin is much bigger than those biggies that people name as the sins. In the New Testament, which was written in Greek, the word that we translate as sin is harmartia. Everybody say harmartia. I heard you. Thank you. Um, Harmartia, and there's actually an entire study of sin. It's called harmartiology. (laughs) Can you imagine... um, dedicating your life to the study of sin, dedicating your life to the harmartiology. <laughs> uh, actually, maybe some of you have a PhD in the study of sin. You're living it out. No, no, that's not, that's not okay. I'm not endorsing it. Uh, I don't mean to make light of it, but just thinking of it more broadly. One of the first uses that's recorded of the word harmartia is in Aristotle's Poetics. And when Aristotle uses the word harmartia, He uses it to describe someone who's missing the mark, someone who is falling short, someone who fails, or what is probably my favorite metaphor, when you arrive at the wrong destination. So so I just imagine, you know, I I intended to go to the gym today, but instead I ended up at Baskin Robbins. Ah, martyology. (laughs) That's a sin. Um, or, or, Or even... I also thought of um, my phone. If I use my, my iPhone, I use Apple Maps, and I talk to Siri, and I ask her to get me to a certain location, and she takes me somewhere else. You know, the question that comes to mind is, who sinned, me or Siri? And probably the more common metaphor that people look to is this, this concept of, of archery. When Aristotle uses the word harmartia, to describe missing the mark, he likely has in mind the idea of, of archery, shooting a bow and arrow. And imagine the bullseye with the concentric circles. Your goal is to hit that bullseye. But if you miss it, that is hamartia. That is what we call a sin. So whether you miss it by a mile or you miss it just by a fraction of an inch, it is hamartia. So in the church, we might ask the question, what is our target? And perhaps it's better to not ask what, but who. Our goal, our aim is to be like Jesus. He is our final destination. He is our goal. We want to live like him. We want to be the kind of person who who loves others, even our enemies, the kind of person who cares for the poor, calls out people in positions of power when they are abusing their power. I want to be like the guy whose last words on the cross were words of forgiveness for the very people who were crucifying him. Yeah, sure, we were probably all taught what sin meant growing up, and indeed it can mean those things. Um, Stealing, adultery, Uh, whatever it might be, those are sins, and, and that is outside of the perfection of Jesus. But too often, we miss the mark when we simply think of what other people are doing as sin. Sin includes things like systemic and individual racism. Sin includes things like putting yourself before the well-being of others, looking out for number one. And I think for far too long, the church has named things like smoking and drinking and dancing. Oh my, those are the biggies that they try to avoid, that we try to avoid. And we, the church, fail to see our own participation participation in sin, in acts of injustice, racism, and putting ourselves before others. So that's the bad news. We as a church have arrived at the wrong destination. 
But my friends, there is good news, and that is grace. Grace, if you don't know what grace is, my friends, grace is amazing. Like the song says, grace is the forgiveness that God has to offer. And as I said in the previous chapter, Paul has been describing grace and how God forgives us. If you miss the mark on that target, God says, hey, we'll count it as a bullseye. If you arrive at the wrong destination, if you arrive at the the Dunkin' Donuts instead of the, the gym, God says, hey, we'll count it as if you went to the gym. That is grace. It's forgiveness when you miss the mark, when you arrive at the wrong place. So Paul is worried that people are going to go about abusing this forgiveness, abusing this grace, and going to say, hey, if I can get by without hitting the target, why even aim for the the bullseye? If I can get by by going to the Dunkin' Donuts and count it as a trip to the gym, why wouldn't I go to the Dunkin' Donuts? And Paul says, you're missing the point. You're sinning, and you're trying to sin. So I come back to that story about my experience the first day of college with with Brad. And when Brad says, what's the minimum I need to do to get an A? I and I'm sure other people are thinking, why would you want to do the very minimum? He's asking, what can I get away with? What can I do or not do and still get the maximum award. And I try to apply this this concept to to a marriage or a relationship. And can you imagine a relationship um, or a marriage? If if you're married to somebody and you're exchanging your vows and you ask them during this ceremony, you ask them, what's the very minimum I have to do for you to stay married to me? Or what can I get away with without you leaving me? That should raise a bunch of red flags. You should be worried about that relationship. If you start asking, hey, do I, do I need to really pick up my dirty socks for you to stay with me? Or what if I invite my buddies over unannounced or, or without letting you know so they can watch football whenever and if the season starts up again? Or, or, or would you leave me if I sold all your jewelry and all your most valued possessions and bought myself a motorcycle with it? That doesn't make sense. That's abuse of relationships and abuse of grace. Because in a good relationship, you don't ask how much you can miss the mark by and still remain in that relationship. You ask how you can do better, how you can be better, and how you can love better. So how can you get closer to that bullseye, or not miss the target at all? How can you arrive at the right destination? These are the questions we should be asking, not how much can we get away with. All right, my friends, keep in mind that grace is amazing. Grace gives you credit for going to the gym when you went to the Dunkin' Donuts or the Baskin Robbins. Grace gives you that bullseye whenever you miss the target altogether. But our goal is not to abuse grace. Our goal is to become more like Jesus. All right, friends, go out and be awesome to each other.